good morning. Before we uh, jump into uh, Nehemiah 5 this morning, I've got a very special story I want you to hear this morning. You know, all through the book of Nehemiah, uh, we see consistency in Nehemiah calling on the Lord in prayer. You see that all through the book, over and over again, as difficulty came, he would call on the Lord. You know, I think sometimes we, myself included, are not really convinced about the power of prayer and that, and that prayer works. You know, most Sundays around here, not, not every week, but a lot of Sundays, we pray for uh, people by name who are lost, and occasionally we'll hear uh, of some results of those prayers. A lot of times we don't, and we wonder, does that, does that really have any effect? Many of you have participated in uh, 40 Days for Life, praying at the abortion clinic here in Little Rock. Many of you have done that other times beside at 40 Days. And, and you may wonder, what is, does that really work? We're, we're not changing the issue of abortion in our culture. You know what? Honestly, although I hope it can be changed, we may never change it. So does, does it even matter that we pray for God to protect life? I want you to hear this morning an amazing story that it absolutely makes a difference, not just about the issue of life, but when we pray, when we pray consistently, when we call on God to do things within his will, it absolutely makes a difference. Listen to this. I grew up in a split home, um, and so when I turned seven, my dad and my stepmom got custody of us, and from that point on, I grew up in church until I turned 18, and then I decided, well, it's college, and I'll go experience the real world and try out this other side of life, and then fast forward to 2016, and I had just recently walked away from a guy that I was involved with and found out that I was pregnant, and his response was, it's not my problem, just deal with it. So I said, I have to go and get rid of it. That's my only option. So I went over that really thick white line of the abortion clinic and they tell you, hey, we're gonna go and take care of your embarrassment and it's just gonna be a little painful and you've got a couple weeks to decide. Let's schedule your appointment. Um, and so I decided to go back to that second appointment. While I was on the table, I was sitting there trying to block out everything, but unfortunately God doesn't let you do that when he doesn't want you to. So I remembered the people that were outside praying, that couple, and I realized that through them praying, God got a hold of my head and my heart and was able to stop me mid-decision and reroute my brain to say, wait, I need to stop what I'm doing and think about this. And in that moment, I realized I can't do this. I've, I've got to make the right decision and can't end a life that wasn't mine to even decide. And so when I walked out of the building, they were there, the couple, still praying, of course, but the lady looked up and she made eye contact with me and she had a genuine smile full of love and that's when I realized that prayer is so, so important in every aspect of life, especially when you want to hear God because if you aren't praying or people aren't praying for you, your ears aren't attuned to hear what He has to say. Fast forward and I've had Natalie and went to church in January 2019 and Pastor Dave shared a message about the abortion clinics and pro-life and all those great things and he decided to play a video and on that video, lo and behold, pops up Bob and Barbara and so of course, I couldn't stop crying and I wanted to thank Bob and Barbara for their things that they've been working so hard on and wanted them to make sure they knew that it wasn't going unnoticed and there were fruits from their labors, of course. And so I met with them and got to let them meet Natalie and they've become like a second family almost to me. Two things that I would want others to know in our church is that one, the women that go into that building, as I have been in that mindset, is that they need love and not judgment. Their brains are completely bound by the decisions that they're having to decide as they feel so empty and alone. And two, is that prayer is so, so important. Because without prayer, 
you're not going to be able to help break that spell that's on their brain and their heart and the emptiness and help them get out of that. Be seated. Uh, this is Heather and Natalie. Natalie, you know why all those people were clapping? You, what's happened? You did break your fingernail. That's terrible for a young lady, isn't it? You know what? You're a miracle of God. That's why they're so excited and clapping today. Now, I want to be sure you caught this in the story. When, when Heather, uh, Heather grew up here at Geyer Springs, she'd been out of church for a while. When she came back on that Sunday in January, she didn't know that the couple that was praying that day that she made that decision was Bob and Barbara until she saw them on the screen. Where are you guys? You all up there in your normal spot? Bob and Barbara Scott right up here. They pray very faithfully, regularly outside that abortion clinic. I don't you know, we've heard frequently about saves there, but never really made any connections. This was the first time we actually knew through Bob and Barbara uh, that a child had been saved as a direct result of their prayer. And you can imagine how startling it was for Heather that Sunday morning to look up on the screen and to see that very same couple who had, had prayed for her that day, that lady who had graciously given her a warm smile, not knowing if she had gone through with it or not, but just shared the love and grace through her smile. You can imagine uh, the impact that had on Heather, and we're so thankful. Natalie, how old are you now? Two? Two. Two, right? Yes. We're so thankful that God has blessed not only Heather, but her family and our church family with Natalie. Prayer works. Don't ever doubt it. You may never hear it this side of eternity, but prayer works. Thank you. Natalie was excited when she got up this morning about playing on the slides and seeing her teacher, so we're going to let her go back and do that uh, right now. You know what? I want to take a minute right now, and I want to ask you here and also those of you in the venue, maybe you're here this morning and you've either been praying for a lost friend or family member for a long time, and it seems like nothing's happening, you're getting discouraged. Maybe there's a situation, some issue in your life that you've been praying for God to intervene and work in, and so far you've not seen anything happen. But if you're here this morning and you've got something that you've been praying through and you're wondering, does God hear, I want you to just stand. We're not going to ask you what your situation is. I want you to just stand. If you're praying and you feel like, man, I need to be reminded, I need to be encouraged uh, that prayer works. I want to pray for you this morning, and I hope you'll remember this picture. This wasn't just about being pro-life. This is about reminding us that God answers prayer. Again, you may not see the answer this side of eternity, but when God's people pray, and when they pray according to his will and his purpose, God is going to answer. What a miracle answer uh, that we were able to see, and what a great reminder that God is faithful. If you're near one of these, you don't have to know their situation. If you would just join me in praying for them, if you'll just place a hand on their shoulder and surround them, we want to pray um, that they see the answers um, that, that they're asking God for, and that if they don't see those answers this side of eternity, God will encourage them and comfort them and help them to be faithful in prayer. Father, thank you for the incredible reminder this morning that you are a faithful God and that you hear our prayers. God, sometimes we, we don't see the answer. Maybe it's not the answer we expected. Maybe it's not in the timing we expected. Maybe we won't see it this side of eternity, but help us to know, help us be reminded today that you hear us, that when your people pray, and when they pray according to your will and, and your purpose in life, that you hear and you answer. God, thank you for the gift of Natalie and the incredible reminder she is that you answer our prayer. God, thank you for Bob and Barbara and for their faithfulness, not just during 40 Days campaigns, but through the years to pray for young women. 
And Father, thank you for many folks who participated in this last campaign who are not willing to give up. Even if we don't see change occur in our nation, we can see change in individual lives. And God, we thank you for that reminder this morning. Father, for these who are are, are maybe a little bit discouraged or struggling this morning, I pray that you would just renew them with the understanding that you are hearing and you are working and help them to trust you in that and fill them with your comfort and that peace which surpasses human understanding. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, last week we saw in Nehemiah those people were greatly discouraged, uh, a lot coming against them from from outside the camp, we talked about the importance of the people being united, working together to accomplish the work. This week we get to chapter 5, and we're going to see that where last week there were external threats and challenges that were dealt with, now we have a major internal problem as they're working to accomplish what God has for them. Chapter 5, look at verse 1. It very simply says, Nehemiah records, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against the Jewish brothers. What's happening? Well, the workers have gone on strike. They're not picketing. They're not walking around with signs. They're not blocking traffic, but they have stopped working, and and they're griping about their conditions, and rightly so. Uh, The word outcry there where he says there was an outcry, that's that's not a small complaint. The word outcry in the Hebrew, it's got the same idea that you see over in in Exodus chapter 14 when the people have, have left Egypt and um, Pharaoh and his army is now chasing them, and they're advancing on them, and the Israelites are literally afraid for their lives. They're afraid they're going to be wiped out by Pharaoh and his army, and so they cry out. It's an outcry. They're literally in fear for their lives. What's happening here is, although it's not an external nation that's enslaving them or threatening their lives, it's their own brothers who are now putting them in a position of starvation and bondage, and they fear for their very lives. They fear that they won't survive. Look in verse 2. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. Now there was a famine evidently in the entire region, perhaps because of a drought, but also recognized so many people had moved back to Jerusalem and so many people had come in from the outlying areas to help build the wall that there just wasn't enough food. Verse 4, and there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. We're no different than our brothers. Our children are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and vineyards. Here's, here's the crisis. Here's what's happening. There are four different groups that are involved in this crisis that Nehemiah is explaining here. We just saw there's a famine, so it's a difficult time for everyone, but that's been compounded by the fact that there's not only a a lack of concern for each other, for their fellow Israelites, but there's also a selfishness and a desire of some to profit from the situation. Here's the four groups of people that are involved in this crisis. The first group, it says they didn't own any land, but they had a large family. They had many sons and daughters. They're working on the wall, but yet they need to get grain to feed their family. Now, the grain, you can imagine during a, fam- during a famine, has probably increased significantly in cost. These people are working on the wall, so they probably have no income. They probably depleted whatever uh, savings they had, and literally they're saying, our families are starving to death. The second group are people who are landowners, and you see that they are saying, look, we, we've had to mortgage our property in order to be able to to buy food. Again, they're working on the wall. Because of the famine and the work on the wall, they can't produce enough. When they say they they mortgage their property, they may have had a farm that was productive, but they're working on the wall. They can't produce enough to feed themselves. They can't produce enough to keep from having to go into debt in order to be able to feed their family. And then the third group is is kind of the landowners, another effect on the landowners. They're back in the land They're in Jerusalem, but all the people who are back in Jerusalem, remember, are not free people. They're still under the rule of Persia. 
Even though Artaxerxes is 800 miles away from Jerusalem, at this time Artaxerxes is ruling most of the known world, so they're under his rule, and just like the Babylonians before him, the Persians, Artaxerxes, put tremendous taxes on the people, very heavy taxes. So this group is saying, look, we can't afford, the taxes are so high, we're having to borrow money just to pay the taxes. And so you have the landowners, they're mortgaging their, their property for food or for taxes. Often they would fall, literally, victims to loan sharks. They would be charged exorbitant interest rates, or their land would be confiscated to cover their loan. And then you had the people who had no land. Many of those were forced into debt slavery. They would have to place their children or members of their family in debt to cover the money they needed to be able to buy food. Well, what about the fourth group? The fourth group of people in the crisis were primarily the cause agents of the crisis. It, it wasn't the Persians. It wasn't the surrounding nations. Um, it wasn't Sanballat or Tobiah or their ilk. The people that were causing the problem, the oppression of these Jews, was because they were being exploited by their own people. The, the wealthy Jews were making the loans, and they were taking advantage of their brothers and they were seizing their property, and they were selling their children into slavery. So here are these people. They're working together. They're trying to restore security and dignity to their, their city. They're rebuilding these walls, which profits everyone, including the wealthy people. Everyone is going to benefit by these walls being rebuilt, and yet the wealthy people are taking advantage of some of the others, of their brothers. Look with me in verse 6. Nehemiah says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself. Now, I'm going to explain that in a minute, but that, that phrase kind of cracks me up. I took counsel with myself. Well, Nehemiah, yes. What do you think we ought to do about this problem? Well, I've been giving that some thought. Okay, that's not what it means, but it's just funny. I took counsel with myself. And I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you're exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who've been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent. That's a good response when you're confronted with sin. And you know you're guilty. They were silent. They could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. That's pretty straightforward. It's not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? So Nehemiah is angry. Now, he's not angry in a sinful way. His anger is righteous. He's concerned for the people. He's concerned not only for those who are being taken advantage of, but for the nation. They're not doing what's right in God's eyes. Why is that? Well, they're not obeying the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was given to tell them how to live with each other, how they were to live together in unity and in harmony, and it was also so that they would be a very different people. God's people should look much different than the people of the world. They were to look different than the nations around them, and they're ignoring the Mosaic law. Well, what was the Mosaic law? Exodus twenty-two twenty-five. 25. God said, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you shall not charge him interest. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19 and 20. Don't charge interest on money, food, or anything you loan. And then he says in verse 20, why? So the Lord your God may bless you. The way it's supposed to work is they were not to take advantage of each other, and, and nations around them, nations who didn't know the Lord, might ask them, well, how in the world are you able to survive? How in the world are you able to make money when you can't charge each other interest on loans, and you're to be able to respond, well, you know what? God cares for our needs. There doesn't need to be interest charged among us. God takes care of us. God says, I want to bless you. If you'll follow my law and my commands, I want to bless you. So Nehemiah took counsel with himself. What does that mean? He, he pondered with his head and his heart. He Literally, it means he gave himself advice. Now, that's good self-control, first of all. Have time to get over your anger. When you get angry, even righteous anger, you ought to take some time and listen to the Lord and ponder with your head and your heart. So he gives careful thought before 
pursuing any course of action. He wasn't just concerned about the financial uh, hardship this was causing, but he was concerned about the breakdown of harmony and unity in the community. Here, God has called him to this great work and to come together to do this great work, and now the work has stopped. And there's not any unity and there's not any harmony in the community. So what does he do? <clears throat> he calls a public assembly to confront the nobles and the officials. Now, that took a lot of courage. Basically, he's calling a public assembly to confront the most influential people in the city. Clearly, to get this project done, Nehemiah uh, needed these influential people to support the work. And he went ahead and confronted them, not worried about the consequence of what might happen. The New Testament principle you see here in Nehemiah is what Paul said in Galatians 1.10. Nehemiah made the decision it was more important to please God than to please men. When he confronted these nobles and officials, these wealthy and influential people, it could have all blown up on him. But he had to do the right thing by God. And can I tell you, the church is already in a time, I think, where consequences, serious consequences, are going to be faced when we speak up and confront what's wrong in our land and in our culture. But we still have to speak up and to say what is right. What does he say to them? In verse 7, he charges them, or the charges, that they're exacting interest from their own people. Now, most of our translations, whatever translation you have this morning, most of our translations in English say that they were charging interest. But as Dr. Douglas Nicolaitan points out in his commentary on Nehemiah, there's some disagreement among interpreters over the exact meaning in the Hebrew. One of two things was happening. Either they were charging exorbitant interest, or it simply means they were seizing collateral. These wealthy people were making uh, secured loans to their brothers, to their family, spiritually, their own family. They're making these secured loans, and now they're calling the loan. In other words, they're saying, hey, that money I loaned you last month to buy food to your family, you need to pay it back right now, and if you can't pay it back right now, I'm taking your land or I'm taking your farm or I'm taking your home. The bottom line is those who had had to borrow simply to feed their family were increasingly unable to get out of debt. Imagine that you own a farm. You're not able to farm it much because you're working on the wall. You're having to, to, to uh, mortgage your farm to buy grain. And then any hope you have of growing crops on your farm to pay back that mortgage is gone because your collateral, your farm gets taken. And so they're at risk of losing everything, even their own freedom and the freedom of their family as some of them are being sold into slavery. In verse 8, evidently, Nehemiah and others who had returned to the land had been redeeming their fellow Jews who had been sold in debt slavery to the surrounding peoples or nations. As they came back into the land, they saw that many of their own people had been sold into slavery. And that was a common practice in that day, but Nehemiah and some of the other Jews were buying them back. Now, typically in the culture, in the Jewish nation, when someone was sold in, to a foreigner, they were typically bought back by a blood relative. That was the responsibility of the blood relative to buy them back out of slavery. So what is Nehemiah doing? What are these other men doing here buying them back? They're acting like their family by redeeming them. They don't just leave the responsibility to a blood relative. Maybe the blood relative wasn't able to do that or they wouldn't have still been in slavery. They said, you know what? These people, spiritually, these people are part of us. These people are our family. So we have to do the right thing and we have to help them. And now they've been buying these people back out of slavery to these foreigners and they find out their own people are becoming their creditors and selling them into slavery. Verse 9, what you're doing is not good. Leaders have to confront the truth. They have to call out sinful behavior. That's their job. And can I tell you, it's no fun. Leaders don't enjoy going to members of the body and calling out sinful behavior. They don't enjoy that at all. It's not any fun. They dread it. They approach it with great fear and trepidation. They approach it with a lot of prayer. They don't enjoy calling out sin in the lives of people, but for the benefit of those people, they're willing to do that because they don't want him to continue down the path to self-destruction. Look at the end of verse 9. It's not just about treating each other right. It's also about our witness. 
the Israelites, God intended for the Israelites to be a light to the Gentile nations. The reason the Mosaic Law was given was not just for stuff for them to do and hoops for them to jump through. They were to be a different people. They were to live by the Mosaic Law to be very different so that surrounding nations would see that they were different and, and would want to know what was different. In, in the situation we're looking here in Nehemiah 5, I wonder what their neighbors thought about their treatment of each other. I wonder what their neighbors thought about their God when they saw how they were treating each other. Can I tell you, there are a lot of people who won't attend a church, not just this church, but won't attend a church today because there are a lot of people that have been hurt by Christians. And so they don't understand our claims or our God. They don't want anything to do with that kind of God, and they certainly don't want anything to do with that kind of people. What does Nehemiah say to them in verse 9? Look, we're to walk in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is an, is an Old Testament term or concept. It, it's, it's not fear as abject terror as you and I think of, but it's an awe of and a devotion to God, and that results in dealing with people with kindness and integrity. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. If you have the fear of the Lord, if you have an awesome sense of devotion and reverence toward God, you would not possibly treat a being created in the image, image of God the way these people are being treated. Verse 10, moreover, Nehemiah says, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest, return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you've been exacting from them. Then they said, this is the nobles and the officials, the, the wealthy, the influential, then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We're, we're going to give it back and not require interest or collateral in the future. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Well, the first thing you see in verse 10 is that Nehemiah of course, is leading by example. He's also lending to people in need, but he's not charging interest and he's not taking their collateral. And so he calls on these leaders to do the same thing. Look, I want you to return any interest that you've charged as well as any property uh, that you've taken that you've foreclosed on. That's a pretty dramatic step. It isn't going to instantly solve all the financial problems, but it gives those who are suffering a, an opportunity for a fresh start and a new start. But most importantly, it's an act of love and, and unity within that community of faith. Verse 12 says they agreed to do as Nehemiah asked. So what does Nehemiah do? He brings in the priest and he says, now you commit, you make this promise before them. It's not just a promise you're making to me. It's a promise you're making to the Lord. What is he saying to them? It's a very serious thing to make a vow to the Lord. And that's still true today. When we commit to the Lord that we're going to do something, it's a serious thing to make that commitment, and we need to be sure that we're going to follow through. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 said, it's better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. And so Nehemiah has him make that vow in front of the priest, and you see at the end of verse 13 it says that he shook out the folds of his garment. That symbolized God's judgment that would come on them if they didn't keep the vow that they would be shaken out, that, that their pockets would be empty, that they would lose everything they had if they did not keep the vow that they had made. And you see that the people said, amen. What does that mean? They said, so be it. Or may God do as you have said. It was a statement of agreement to what had been said and what had been done. And now down toward the end of the chapter, verse 14, moreover, Nehemiah is speaking, moreover from that time, that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years. During that time, he says, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so. Why? Because of the fear of the Lord. Look at verse 16. I also persevered in the work on this wall. We acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. What is he saying? We're doing the same thing we were asking you to do. 
we weren't just lording it over you and, and being the supervisors and telling you what to do. We got out there and got our hands dirty. Verse 17, moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox, six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Now, don't see this as Nehemiah bragging on himself. It's just an illustration of his leadership. If he required or expected anything of the people, he expected even more of himself. He didn't take the allowance that he was allowed to take as the governor. He took care of himself. He didn't want to place too heavy a burden on his people. Why? It's that little phrase we saw in the middle of the passage. He was motivated by his fear of God. And again, fear means an incredible uh, reverence. Nehemiah had such a reverence for God that it had great impact on the way he lives. It should have great impact on the way we live our lives when we really reverence the Lord. It has impact on how we respect him and obey him and submit to him and how we worship him. Nehemiah lived in fear of the Lord, and that's why he did the things that he did as a leader. Now, what, what does chapter 5 say to us today? We, we don't find ourselves in this particular situation where throughout our body, um, different people in the body are exploiting other people, taking advantage of it. We, we don't find ourselves in that situation. But this little snapshot in chapter 5 tells us a few things. I want to mention just two um, very simply. Clearly, the biggest application is this. We're to care for others, and that starts within the body. It starts within the body. The Jewish people, the Israelites, were to live according to the law that God had set so they would be a very different people, and that way of living would impact the nations around them. But it had to start with God's own people. It had to start within the body. You know, selfishness is one of the greatest uh, weapons in, in Satan's arsenal. Insisting on what, what I want or taking advantage of others for our own self-interest should not be characteristic of a Christ follower. Paul said it well in Philippians 2, don't be selfish. Don't merely look out for your own interests, look out for the interests of others. Consider others more important than yourself. Have the attitude Christ had, although he was God, what did he do? He came, he relinquished everything that he had in heaven, and he came and lived among us and was made as a servant, as a bondservant. Paul said that's the way that we're to live, we're, we're to live as believers. Now, as far as I know, no one in our body is doing what is described here in Nehemiah chapter 5, as far as I know. If I find out, we'll visit. But I don't think that's happening. In fact, I want to say too this morning, because we have several bankers in our church, if you're a banker, um, there's nothing wrong with charging interest or requiring security on a loan. We just need to be sure if we're in business, not just with people in the body, but, but if we're in business, we need to be sure that we're doing everything in a fair and a just manner. But what about caring for the body? What about us? What about starting right here? What, what does that look like? Well, sometimes it's financial. Sometimes you'll see someone in our body that has a tremendous need, and it's not because of any fault of their own, and sometimes it's, it's a financial need that needs to be taken care of, and, and God may impress on you to step up and take care of that need. That's what it looks like. But sometimes it's, it's not a, a physical or financial need. Sometimes it's a spiritual need. You'll know someone within the body that's going through a great struggle. You know, what it looks like for us in the body as far as caring for each other is maybe a, a couple of questions that are always on the tip of our tongue. How can I help and how can I pray? Now, if, you're, if you've been a part of this body for, for some time, you know that the Geyer Springs family does pretty well in caring for the needs of our body. In fact, we're known in our community as a, as a caring church. And I can tell you, if you're, if you're in here, if you're part of the body, we're, we're not perfect, but our best care is from something Pastor Jason mentioned at the beginning of the service. Our best care comes through our small groups. 
I, I can look around the room this morning and I might see two or three people that I've seen a prayer request or had a conversation with this week that I know are, are struggling, but for the most part, I can't look across this room and I certainly can't see everyone that's in the venue, although I know many who attend there. I, I don't know everyone's needs. Who knows their needs? They're a small group. And I just say that to say to you this morning, if you simply come to worship and you're not connected to a Sunday morning group or to a Sunday night life group, and we don't know your need, please forgive us for not taking care of your need, but we have no way of knowing that. It's important within a body this size to be connected to a a small group. You remember in verse 9, Nehemiah reminded them, those who don't know the Lord are watching how we treat each other. Jesus said it this way, "By, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. That's not just a feeling. That's not just emotion. That, that's an action word. People will know you're my disciples if they see that you care for and you meet the needs of one another. Can I say this? If you're in a small group, because there are some who are not, we all need to practice looking outside of our sphere of influence and our sphere of friends. We all need to practice as the body, not just looking within our small group, but looking across the body. And you may see someone who seems to be burdened. You may not even know them. That's okay. How can I help? How can I pray? The body needs to be such incredible, loving, and caring people that it gets the attention of the world around us. Now, there's a second thing in this passage, and I'm fixing to go to meddling, okay? This passage says something about our resources and our money, and it says that how we handle our resources and our money matters to God. You you can't ignore, and I know we don't like to talk about money, but you can't ignore that that's addressed in this passage. You see, it's it's not just a matter, when you think about your giving to the Lord and, and to the church, so the church can carry out his work. It's not a matter of giving some of my money to God and and doing what I want with the rest. It all belongs to him. All of it belongs to him. Verse 12, this is interesting. Look back at verse 12. Nehemiah confronts them, and he says, you need to return everything, and it simply tells us they returned everything. They didn't fuss, they didn't fume, they didn't argue. They said, well, we're not going to be able to eat. You know what? They didn't need it. What they had taken, they didn't need. They were wealthy. Well, I'm not wealthy. No, we're all wealthy. Varying degrees, but we're all wealthy. They did not need the stuff that they had taken from their brothers. They didn't need it. I read that verse, and it made me ask, What do I need, and is God taking care of me? We've all got more than we need. And the reality is, I'm not going to outgive God. I'm not going to be left without when he tells me to give something away. These nobles and officials were so wealthy, they didn't have to worry about being left without. But let me tell you, even if they had to give back all the interest and all the collateral, and it left them with nothing, God was not going to let them go hungry. He'd already made that clear. What do I need? And is God taking care of me? You know, I, I, you and I miss a blessing when we don't use our finances for his purposes. First time I learned this, I was 20 years old. I was attending Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, working on my master's, and I went to visit my sister's church down in Austin. And I was sitting in the service, and Uh, By the way, I I never carry a wallet or checkbook, so if you need money from me, give me a heads up, okay? Sitting in the service, and I hear about this tremendous need, and the Spirit of God tells me that I'm to give X amount to this need. So I slip out of the service, go out to my car and get my checkbook, and I open it up to write the check that the Holy Spirit told me to write, and it was all that I had left in my account. And the next day, tuition was due for that semester. I wrote the check. The next morning, in my mailbox, you know what I found? Check for that amount. Cover my tuition. You know what that did? That, that built my faith in knowing that I could count on God to supply my need. 
If I would just be faithful to him, he's going to supply my need. You've heard me say before, I sent three children to private Christian colleges with no savings for college and no expendable income. And I, every year when, when they were in college, and that was stretched over more than four years because we had three kids, but every year when it would come time to do income taxes and look at all the financial stuff, it was like, wow, how did that happen? How did that work? God, God supplied. Several years ago, listen, I'm all about, I grew up in a single-parent home. Mom was a school teacher in a private school, so you know what kind of salary that is, and there were a lot of things we did without. So I have to be careful that I'm not hoarding and hanging on to stuff all the time. I think it's important to save. I think it's important to prepare for retirement so you're not a burden on your family. Oh, that's all important. But several years ago, God told me that I was hanging on to too much. And so I took a portion that God showed me and I began and I've continued to just give that away to people in need. Haven't missed anything. In, in Nehemiah, these people were doing a great work for the Lord. That work was going to be a testimony to the nations around them, to people who didn't know God, but that testimony would be tarnished if in the middle of doing this great work, they weren't expressing love and concern for each other that didn't result in practical caring for the needs of their brothers and their families. God has called us as his body, not to just keep it all inward and selfish here, but to start within our walls and to make sure we're caring for each other. If it don't work at home, we shouldn't export it. We've got to care for each other before we can care for those in the world around us. And God calls us to be faithful stewards of what he's blessed us with, not just the little bit we give to him, but of all of it. And if he needs it, he should be able to call on us and ask for it, and we should trust him enough to know that if he asks us to give something up, we're not going to do without. He's going to care for us and meet our needs.